Now turn to part one. Part one. We will hear a man talking first to a receptionist and then to a doctor at the health centre. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Good morning. What can I do for you? Uh, yes, I'm currently visiting this area, but I injured myself when I was doing sport a while ago, and I still feel pain. So I wondered whether I could see a doctor here. Sure, sir. We can take you on as a temporary patient. I'll just take down some of your personal details. May I have your name, please? Yes, it's Peter Smith. All right, Peter. And where are you currently staying here? At ninety-five Cross Street. And the county? Walkley. That's W A L K L E Y. Okay. And can I have a contact number? Uh, it's four six eight nine five three two four. Okay, thanks. Can you just round there? The doctor will see you in a minute. Before you hear the rest of the conversation. You have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now listen and answer questions four to ten. Now, how can I help you? It's Peter Smith, isn't it? Yes, I had a sporting accident, and a doctor at home treated me, but I'm still getting some pain. Hmm. Right. Uh, first of all, I want to ask you a few questions. Okay. Well, what sport were you doing when you got injured? Playing tennis with my friends. No,、oh, I see. Did you hurt your elbow or wrist? Oh no. I had my knee sprained, which was the original problem. Right. And when did this happen? Uh, that was three weeks ago now, so it was about June eighteenth. Hmm. And you said you had medical treatment at home. Uh, yeah. The doctor said I didn't need an X-ray or things like that, and he just told me to use an ice pack. Fine. Anything else? Yes, and I've been using a walking stick to help me get around. Right. Now, what problems are you having during walking? Well, actually, I can walk, yet I still can't go upstairs, so I've been sleeping downstairs. Hmm. Now you said your knee still hurts. Well, no, actually, it's getting better. It's my back hurting me now. It really aches at night, and I cannot sleep well. Hmm. I have several suggestions for you. Great. First, you should put the stick away, as that's probably the source of the problem. Oh, really? I wish I'd know. After that, I can prescribe you something to relax the muscles in your back. Oh, sorry to be difficult, but I've had something like that in the past, and there were many side effects, and I don't want to take it. Would you recommend anything else? Well, yes, we do have a leaflet showing some exercises you can do yourself at home. If you do them every day, they'll soon be effective. Great, I'll do that. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part 2 You will hear a tour guide from Pine Garden giving visitors a general introduction to each part of the area. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to Pine Garden. My name is Manuel. Before you wander off and begin your exploration of the garden, I'm going to keep all of you informed of several things about this building. I know you're eager to start your wandering and exploring, so I will try to keep this as short as possible. Firstly, I think I should explain to you something that you can do with your ticket. If you're much more into nature, the optimal section is our planting area, where all the visitors can plant small flowers and bulbs on their own. These plants will gradually grow and then become part of our garden. The activities of planting are totally free. However, if your hands are sensitive, we strongly recommend you to buy a pair of garden gloves in order to protect your skin. Also here at Pine Garden, we use wooden materials from the trees that have been felled in our very own pine forest to make carved goods. If you are interested, and want to get involved and try by yourself, you can join one of our bush timbering lessons for free, where you'll have the opportunity to make your own keyring with the help of a skilled woodsman. Our aviary is the most popular attraction, where you can see a whole range of bird species. More surprisingly, it is free to enter this section, yet you should pay a small amount of supplement for the entry to the hummingbird section. Also, the insect section that is not very far from the aviary might arouse your interest. There you will find a number of interesting insects, such as butterflies, pocket ladybugs, dragonflies and so on, and there's no extra charge. Unfortunately, some areas are now temporarily limited to visitors today. For example, the gift shop that closed earlier this year will remain out of bounds for another month or so. As I've said before, the restaurant still offers free food and snacks for you, and if you do feel like purchasing a gift, why not buy that special potted bush or orchid from our plant care centre? What's more, our new treetop cafe is now in the process of construction. It will be very compelling when it's finished. Actually, our model town has already opened in advance. That is of great interest to the public. Also, our tourist office is ordinarily available to give tourists many aids. But the officer is sick at home. Please do not be disappointed by this, since our open visiting areas also provide quite an experience. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. I'd also like to introduce our plant experts responsible for the wonderful plant exhibitions here at Pine Garden. Mrs. Mary is one of our specialists, who is personally in charge of our awesome displays that can all be found in the local wild nature. Mr. Burson is responsible for looking after varieties of plants that grow in much drier and hotter climates than ours, which is a difficult task, although it does mean there's no need to conserve water for it. If you go into the glass house, there are a large number of plants that he has managed to grow without any need for rain or irrigation. Mr. Smith is in charge of keeping all the visitors fed at our restaurant by growing varieties in the earth and on trees and bushes that are edible. Now, Mr. Nunny here is our specialist on the most universally growing plant in the world, grass. You may have noticed how beautifully green and lush our grounds are thanks to his specialist knowledge. Mr. Acanlan guarantees our soil is compiled with nutrients. All the specialist habitats are hence supported and encouraged. He succeeded in doing this by fertilizing the earth with his special formula that he originally constructed by himself. Finally, I'd like to invite you all to meet Dr. Mandelson, the manager of our landscaping team, who works closely with all the other experts to make sure everybody works together to create a landscape that is pretty as well as sustainable. Well, that just about rounds it up. 
Now, if anyone has questions... That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a trainee music teacher called Joe talking to his supervisor about the school marching band that he has been given responsibility for. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. So, how are you getting on with your teaching practice at the high school, Joe? Well, I've been put in charge of the school marching band, and it's quite a responsibility. I'd like to talk it over with you. Go ahead. You better start by giving me a bit of background. Okay. Well, the band has students in it from all years. So they're aged 11 to 18, and there are about 50 of them altogether. It's quite a popular activity within the school. I've never worked with a band of more than 20 before, and this is very different. I can imagine. They aren't really good enough to enter national band competitions, but they're in a regional one later in the term. Even if they don't win, and I don't expect them to, hopefully it'll be an incentive for them to try and improve. Yes, hopefully. Well, now the town council's organizing a carnival in the summer, and the band has been asked to perform. If you ask me, they aren't really up to it yet, and I need to get them functioning better as a band, and in a very short time. Have you been doing anything with them? Apart from practicing the music, I mean. I played a recording I came across of a drummer talking about how playing in a band had changed his life, I think it was an after-dinner speech. I thought it was pretty inspiring, because being in the band had stopped him from getting involved in crime. The students seemed to find it interesting, too. That's good. I'm planning to show them that old film from the 1940s, Strike Up the Band, and talk about it with the students. What do you think? Good idea. As it's about a school band, it might make the students realize how much they can achieve if they work together. That's what I've got in mind. I'm hoping I can take some of the band to a parade that's going to take place next month. A couple of marching bands will be performing, and the atmosphere should be quite exciting. It depends on whether I can persuade the school to hire a coach or two to take us there. Hmm. They sound like good ideas to me. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Can I tell you about a few people in the band who I'm finding it quite difficult to cope with? I'm sure you'll have some ideas about what I can do. Go ahead. There's a flautist who says she loves playing in the band. We rehearse twice a week after school, but she's hardly ever there. Then she looks for me the next day and gives me a very plausible reason. 
She says she had to help her mother, or she's been ill, but to be honest, I don't believe her. Oh, dear. Any more students with difficulties? Plenty. Uh, there's a trumpeter who thinks she's the best musician in the band, though she certainly isn't. She's always saying what she thinks other people should do, which makes my job pretty difficult. She sounds a bit of a nightmare. You can say that again. Uh, one of the trombonists has got an impressive sense of rhythm and could be an excellent musician, except that he has breathing difficulties, and he doesn't really have enough breath for the trombone. He'd be much better off playing percussion, for instance, but he refuses to give up, so he ends up only playing half the notes. I suppose you have to admire his determination. Maybe. One of the percussionists isn't too bad, but he never seems to interact with other people and he always rushes off as soon as the rehearsal ends. I don't know if there are family reasons or what, but it isn't good in a band where people really need to feel they're part of a group. Hmm. There are others, too, but at least that gives you an idea of what I'm up against. Do you have any thoughts about what I can do, Lizzie? That is the end of Part 3. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture for business students about business values. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In public discussion of business, we take certain values for granted. Today, I'm going to talk about four of them. Collaboration, hard work, creativity and excellence. Most people would say they're all good things. I'm going to suggest that's an over-simple view. The trouble with these values is that they're theoretical concepts removed from the reality of day-to-day -day business. Pursue values by all means, but be prepared for what may happen as a result. They can actually cause damage, which is not at all the intention. Business leaders generally try to do the right thing, but all too often the right thing backfires if those leaders adopt values without understanding and managing the side effects that arise. The values can easily get in the way of what's actually intended. OK, so the first value I'm going to discuss is collaboration. Uh, let me give you an example. On a management training course I once attended, we were put into groups and had to construct a bridge across a stream using building blocks that we were given. The rule was that everyone in the team had to move at least one building block during the construction. This was intended to encourage teamwork. But it was really a job best done by one person. The other teams tried to collaborate on building the structure and descended into confusion, with everyone getting in each other's way. Our team leader solved the challenge brilliantly. She simply asked everyone in the team to move a piece a few centimetres to comply with the rule 
and then let the person in the team with an aptitude for puzzles like this build it alone. We finished before any other team. My point is that the task wasn't really suited to team working, so why make it one? Teamwork can also lead to inconsistency, a common cause of poor sales. In the case of a smartphone that a certain company launched, one director wanted to target the business market and another demanded it was aimed at consumers. The company wanted both directors to be involved, so gave the product a consumer-friendly name but marketed it to companies. The result was that it met the needs of neither group. It would have been better to let one director or the other have his way, not both. Now, industriousness or hard work. It's easy to mock people who say they work hard. After all, a hamster running around in a wheel is working hard and getting nowhere. Of course, hard work is valuable, but only when properly targeted. Otherwise, it wastes the resources that companies value most, time and energy, and that's bad for the organisation. There's a management model that groups people according to four criteria. Clever, hardworking, stupid and lazy. Here, lazy means having a rational determination not to carry out unnecessary tasks. It doesn't mean trying to avoid work altogether. Most people display two of these characteristics, and the most valuable people are those who are both clever and lazy. They possess intellectual clarity, and they don't rush into making decisions. They come up with solutions to save the time and energy spent by the stupid and hard-working group. Instead of throwing more man-hours at a problem, the clever and lazy group looks for a more effective solution. Next, we come to creativity. This often works well. Creating an attention-grabbing TV commercial, for example, might lead to increased sales. But it isn't always a good thing. Some advertising campaigns are remembered for their creativity without having any effect on sales. This happened a few years ago with the launch of a chocolate bar. Subsequent research showed that plenty of consumers remembered the adverts but had no idea what was being advertised. The trouble is that the creator derives pleasure from coming up with the idea and wrongly assumes the audience for the campaign will share that feeling. A company that brings out thousands of new products may seem more creative than a company that only has a few, but it may be too creative and make smaller profits. Creativity needs to be targeted to solve a problem that the company has identified. Just coming up with more and more novel products isn't necessarily a good thing. And finally, excellence. We all know companies that claim they strive for excellence, but it takes a long time to achieve excellence. In business, being first with a product is more profitable than having the best product. A major study of company performance compared pioneers, that is, companies bringing out the first version of a particular product, with followers, the companies that copied and improved on that product. The study found that the pioneers commanded an average market share of 29%, while the followers achieved less than half that, only 13%, even though their product might have been better. Insisting on excellence in everything we do is time-consuming, wastes energy and leads to losing out on opportunities. Sometimes second-rate work is more worthwhile than excellence. Make sure it's excellent sounds like a good approach to business, but the just-get-started approach is likely to be more successful. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. 
That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Writing task 1 in IELTS can seem tricky, but with a good strategy, you can write a clear and effective report. Here's a breakdown of the steps to tackle it. Understanding the task. Identify the visual type. It will be a graph, chart, diagram, map, or table. Read the instructions. Make sure you understand what kind of summary you need to write. Overall trends, comparisons, etc. Analyzing the information. Find the key features. Don't get bogged down by every detail. Look for the most important trends or comparisons in the data. Focus on data and avoid opinions. This is a report, so stick to the facts presented in the visual. Structuring your response. Introduction. One sentence. Briefly paraphrase the question and mention the visual type. For example, the bar chart illustrates. Overview. One two sentences. Summarize the main features you identified, without going into specifics. Detailed paragraphs. Two three paragraphs. Each paragraph should focus on one key feature.